Hey, U.S. History students, here's our final video that we've got for you. This one's going to be all about presidential politics and the presidents who make up the latter part of the 20th century. We're going to jump right into this thing in 1968 and take a look at the 68 election and how that shapes the next 40 years of presidential politics. You've got Nixon, you've got Humphrey, you've got Wallace all running in this highly contested election. Uh, the election is going to be contested by and large because of the breakup of the traditional Democratic base. You had the backlash against the Great society society programs like the Civil Rights Act and the Voting Rights Act that were championed by LBJ. You had the segregationist movement that really was championed by Wallace. It started to chip away at the traditional Democratic foundation. And then you had Richard Nixon. And Richard Nixon decides he's going to go and get some of those traditional Southern stronghold states. He's going to do this by taking up some of the traditional Democratic, Southern Democratic rallying cries such as states' rights. Of course, that goes back to the Civil War and the right to own slaves. He's going to run a wedge right through the working class um, that really predominantly made up the uh, labor unions and the working class Midwestern Great Lakes region of the Democratic Party. And he's going to just uh, basically tap into the silent moral majority, uh, like fundamentalist Christian and um like moral voters of that late time period of 1968. And he's going to do this pretty convincingly because he's going to paint himself as the law and order candidate. Now he's looking at what happens at 68 in the democratic convention. He's looking at the counterculture. He's looking at things like the Manson's murders and drugs uh, usage in San Francisco at the hate Ashbury that we talked about in our last episode. And he's going to say, I'm going to stand against those sorts of things. And what Nixon does is he creates a coalition government, this Nixon coalition, coalition government delivers him to the White House, breaking up what had been a really solid block of Democratic presidents, uh, only interrupted by Eisenhower, who was a war hero. So that's kind of understand it, uh, understood, I guess, uh, from that perspective. Now, Nixon uh, certainly uh, deals a death blow to the New Deal coalition. All of the various states and politicians that have made up that traditional Democratic Party, they're going to splinter and fracture out. And this is going to have wide ranging ramifications down the road. Now, from Nixon's perspective, he's going to really seek to renormalize. You can think about that idea of uh, uh, conformity or normalcy that we've talked about in the past. He wants to start to overcome some of the countercultural issues. He wants to sort of bring America back to its greatness. He's going to do this by fighting some of the big ills during this time period. Unfortunately for Nixon, his presidency is marred by both an energy crisis in the early 1970s when OPEC uh, puts a trade embargo on uh, import or exports of oil, which hurts importation of oil and starts to slow down the American economy. At the same time, though, the American economy suffers from an inflation in currency. So while you've got economic growth going down, you have inflation going up and you have this phenomenon called stagflation. And this is really going to stock all of the 1970s presidents. Then Nixon also gets mired in various Scandals. Last time we talked about the Pentagon Papers and the issues with the Cambodian incursions that took place in the Vietnam War. Nixon had a secret group of people he called the plumbers, and the plumber's job was to fix leaks. Unfortunately, in 1972, while trying to deliver an election that obviously Nixon had nothing to fear, the plumbers break into the Watergate Hotel. And they uh, burglarize the offices of the Democratic National Committee looking for strategy secrets. They're discovered um, by a night watchman. There's arrests that are made. This looks like it's all going to get swept under the rub, rug, but two dogged reporters named Woodward and Bernstein pick up the scent and a national scandal ensues. Now, Nixon may or may not have been able to get away with this, but he had installed a secret uh, audio recording system in the White House, and he's caught with people like H.R. Haldeman and John Mitchell, who was the attorney general at the time, discussing the cover up and the payoffs to these plumbers, which lands him in super hot water. Eventually, most of Nixon's confidants and uh, advisors will all be found guilty of various crimes in the early 1970s, ripping apart his cabinet and really undermining his presidential authority. Now, Nixon did try to keep these uh, tapes secret, but in a landmark lawsuit, uh, U.S. versus Nixon 1974, executive 
privilege is denied and the president is going to be forced to turn over the tapes. He, of course, uses this as the opportunity to resign because he knows he's going to be impeached. He knows he will be kicked out of office. He will be, go down in infamy, infamy for this. And he is replaced by Gerald Ford. Now, Gerald Ford is somewhat of a controversial U.S. president because he was actually never elected. He becomes vice president after Spiro Agnew gets busted for not paying his taxes. And then uh, when Nixon resigns, he becomes the president. And his uh, policies, by and large, are going to be a continuation of the uh, policies that were put forth by Nixon. And uh, he will roundly be uh, sort of panned by uh, many of those Democrats who had gone over to Nixon because they saw Nixon as a betrayal. And then when Ford pardons Nixon, he ushers in uh, the opportunity for Jimmy Carter to become the president of the United States. So Ford and Nixon are really closely linked, and they're going to be most closely linked because of uh, that pardon and many of the policies that were in place from the uh, 1968 through 1976 widely go unchallenged and unchanged. But Carter is a little bit different because Carter is something of a Washington outsider. He is not the type of president who has strong connections inside of the beltway. You might think of the way that Donald Trump ran in 2016. He also will seek to shake up many of the policy platforms that existed during um, this Cold War time period with really mixed results. So Carter makes his way in. He's the quintessential uh, Washington outsider. He calls himself a simple peanut farmer from Georgia. He comes in and he has a really strong focus on energy independence and cleaning up the environment. He wants the United States to start to be a better place to live. Now, the cleaning up the environment and the in energy initiative stuff makes a lot of sense because in uh, the midsection of uh, uh, the century or the decade, excuse me, there's another oil embargo that's laid down by OPEC which creates more shortages. And so energy independence and clean energy seem to make sense. Clean energy initiatives and environmental initiatives were also championed by Richard Nixon, showing that there was some bipartisan support. The EPA was formed by the Nixon administration. Um, Carter will just take it one step further because he wants to start cleaning up Superfund sites, places like the Love Canal, which is where 21,000 uh, gallons of toxic waste were dumped into an abandoned canal contaminating groundwater. Um, or many Americans, if they didn't know about the Love Canal, certainly have images of the burning Cuyahoga River in 1969, where the uh, oil and gas on top of the river outside of Cleveland catches on fire. So you've got this horrible image of water burning as it runs past a major city. And most Americans agreed that the environment needed to be cleaned up. And maybe we should start weaning ourselves off of foreign oil because it was really, really disgusting disruptive to the American economies. This small group of countries, um, this uh, conglomeration um, or cartel of countries controlled a large amount of America's energy resources. And when they decide to shut off the taps and stop importing oil in 1979, there's huge gas lines, there's forced rationing of oil and gas. Um, people are wind, uh, lined up around the block um, and, and gas prices quadruple. This leads to a huge disruption in the American automotive industry because traditional American gas guzzling cars coming out of Detroit um, are no longer favored. And instead, smaller Japanese imports start to take over. Companies like Toyota and Honda uh, inch their way into the American market, which will have devastating economic impacts in places like Detroit and Michigan at large. Right. So this energy independence movement um, that the president uh, Carter had championed seemed like it would make sense. But there was a lot of backlash. Many Americans simply didn't want to make the changes that were necessary, despite the fact that there was this broad economic downturn that had been caused all throughout this decade due to oil importation. Now, Carter also runs into some problems because of the turning over the Panama Canal back to the Panamanians as he tries to soften uh, imperialistic style relations with South America that had been place, in place since Teddy Roosevelt. And he's also uh, much more confrontational, it seems, uh, with the Soviets as compared to uh, both Ford and Nixon, who had championed detente. And many of the uh, softening and warming of the relations between the two sides during the earlier part of the Cold War war uh, start to fall apart. And, and outside of the Helsinki Accords, which is a non-binding resolution 
that sort of set into uh, stone, but it's not like hard stone, uh, some of the post-World War II agreements about territory and destabilization, um, the United States really starts to have a lot of uh, confrontational uh, interactions with the Soviet Union again. And this is, of course, um, spurred on by the 1979 invasion of Afghanistan. The United States famously uh, boycotts the 1980 Olympics. Um, they have stopped trading grain with the Soviet Union. And then if this, as if things couldn't get bad enough for the Carter administration, they run headlong into the Iranian Revolution. Now, remember, the Shah of Iran had been uh, put into power by a 1950 U.S.-backed coup. Uh, this was widely unpopular. A religious leader named Ayatollah Khomeini starts to foment revolution um, and takes over a reform protest against the Shah, who was wildly unpopular. The United States embassy is overridden by the students and these fundamentalists. 52 hostages are taken. They're in hostages for 444 days. The United States does attempt to rescue these hostages, uh, but the failed Operation Eagle Claw leaves eight service members dead, four wounded in the deserts of Iran when a helicopter and a refueling tanker collide, uh, creating a massive fireball. The Delta Force warriors who were there, the pilots who were there, were wildly underprepared for this type of operation. This will set into motion uh, U.S. Uh, special command forces that eventually will kill Osama bin Laden. Uh, the genesis point for a lot of that training in these types of missions is Operation Eagle Claw. But really, at the end of the day, what ends the standoff in Iran and what ends the disastrous uh, Jimmy Carter presidency is Ronald Reagan, right? Now, Reagan is going to need to form a new Republican coalition because a lot of people felt betrayed by Nixon. And there was this feeling that if uh, Reagan had run instead of Ford, maybe he could have secured enough Republican support to win the right White House. But in the four years between 76 and 80, uh, a new coalition, this new right coalition that we talked about a couple episodes back is formed. And this ushers in this Reagan wave. And as you can see here, he roundly defeats Carter, um, who uh, was wildly unpopular during this time. Now, Reagan, he's going to look to do the opposite of some of the things that Carter was doing, whereas Carter uh, favored government regulation and reform efforts to help with creating a better society. Uh, Reagan is much more willing to deregulate. He wants to cut taxes. Uh, he's going to champion a, a something called triple trickle down economics or what's called Reaganomics. Uh, and then he's going to also tap into some of the wildly popular Nixon platform ideas like federalism, like states rights. Uh, and, and really starting to take on what many people have thought was an activist judiciary because the Warren court um, was seen as a, a branch of the government that was writing laws, but the judiciary is not supposed to write laws. They're just supposed to determine constitutionality. The big cornerstone case, of course, is going to be 73, Roe versus Wade, and there's going to be a conservative backlash. And so Reagan starts to champion many of the Republican platform issues um, that are still with the Republican Party, or at least were up and through uh, 2016. And so Reagan really starts to focus on changing America. He has this idea of mourning in America. He wants to shake away this this uh, Vietnam syndrome. He wants to shake away uh, the, the stagflation. He wants America to wake up. And so whereas Jimmy Carter has famously given this malaise speech uh, where he talks about the issue of America being too uh, consumeristic, that the United States needs to start getting back to some of the more moral issues, Reagan says some of the morality of the United States is consumerism, is capitalism, because that's anti-communism. He starts to play into that Cold War uh, mentality. Of course, Reagan was very famously part of some of the Second Red Scare and the McCarthy blacklisting that took place in Hollywood. Reagan was an actor, uh, after all, during that time period. And that's really where he cut his chops. And he was also very strong against crime, the same way Nixon had been uh, very famously taking on the Black Panther movement in California in the 1970s and the student protest. Uh, and voice movement that took place in Berkeley, uh, where we talked about with Mario Salvo. And so what Nixon starts to do is he starts to, at the same time, at uh, one time, create more of an overarching framework for the national uh, federal government to step in where the federal government or the politician, in this case, the president, feels necessary, while at the same time championing the idea of more states' rights, where states can determine their own laws. But there's this kind of sort of sticky relationship between 
Reagan's idea of federalism and what was advanced in the Federalist Papers. For more on that, feel free to email Mr. Clemenhagen. Now, in terms of Reaganomics, this is going to be the centerpiece of uh, Reagan's policies. Uh, and these economic policies are still with us today. Essentially, Reagan felt that if you cut regulation, cut taxes, and balance the budget as much as possible, companies would have more money to reinvest in their operations. In the short term, this would grow output. In the long term, this was supposed to increase wages and consumerism. It was supposed to be a win-win. Unfortunately for Reagan's and, and uh, Reagan and many of the accolade, uh, accolades of this uh, policy, this has never been proven to be true. Uh, and in fact, the 2017 tax cuts, 2017-2018 uh, tax cuts, uh, which were meant to create the same sort of type of stimulus, by and large have failed. So there seems to be an issue with the idea, although the idea does seem to make sense uh, in a vacuum, very similar to communism, I guess. Now, Reagan's influence can be felt in American politics well after he leaves office. From George H.W. Bush, who had been his vice president and is, and is widely seen as people voting for Reagan a third time, to uh, Bill Clinton, who is very much a centrist Democrat, to the uh, contract in America and the Republican sweep of the House in the 90s, which we'll get to in a second, and even George W. Bush, who also champions many of Reagan's policies uh, with the neocon movement through 2000. And eight. Uh, and, and again, we don't see a large departure in the Republican Party until 2016. Now, in, in 1992, uh, the Reagan uh, revolution breaks against the rock of Bill Clinton. Now, Bill Clinton is a very popular, very savvy politician. He's very much a centrist Democrat. He's not looking to revive the New Deal. He's looking at making small scale reforms uh, inside of the federal government um, that are more democratic in nature, but he's also willing to be tough on crime. He's also willing to cut taxes where necessary. So he wins a very close election, as you can see here, and he comes in and, and re-seizes power for the Democratic Party. Now, he's going to have some more socially minded policies, such as the don't ask, don't tell policy on gay rights inside of the military. He will try to, with his wife, uh, Hillary Clinton, Clinton being a, a chief surrogate, will try to create something very similar to uh, the Affordable Care Act with mandatory uh, enrollment into healthcare provider programs. Companies will pay for those. That's going to break down as a result of Republican backlash. He will also champion NAFTA, which is this giant free trade block uh, meant to break down tariffs between Canada, the United States, and Mexico and create a uh, free trade zone. But really what Myers, the pre uh, Clinton presidency more than anything else, is going to be scandal, scandal, and more scandal, right? And most of that is going to be a, uh, at the direction that this this breaking down of the Clinton presidency, um, and he is a two-term president, but it's going to be directed by Newt Gingrich. Now, Newt Gingrich um, is part of a backlash politician uh, movement against some of the liberal reforms and just the, the basic perception that the Clintons were dirty people, uh, which – carried right up, you know, this is part of that stain that Hillary Clinton carried with her up into 2016. And Gingrich uh, will ride this Republican wave into office in 1994 during the midterm elections, where the United States House of Representatives will be seized, seized by the Republican Party for the first time in 40 years. And he's going to force through this contract with America, where he's going to look to slash budgets. He's going to look for more of the Federalist reforms that we talked about with both Nixon and with Reagan. He very much wants to take on welfare because he feels that welfare is an entitlement program, that states are forced to fund something that the federal federal government is forcing on them an unfunded mandate, if you will. Um, and uh, because Clinton is politically vulnerable because of some of these scandal issues that we'll talk about in a second, Clinton is forced to take on welfare reform. And by the mid 1990s, you can see that the percentage of the US population who is on welfare is at the highest it had ever been. Now, some would argue that the need for that to occur was because of programs like redlining, because of NAFTA, because of some of the stagflation issues in the 1970s that really crippled cities. And most of the people who lived in cities tended to be in minorities who also had not had the economic advantages of the 1950s and 1960s. Wherever you fall in the political spectrum, 
welfare was a very large pro program in terms of the United States budget pales in comparison to defense spending, but it was a very large social program. And so uh, that combined with backlash against welfare queens um, and this idea that undeserving people were receiving money led to a slash in the welfare program uh, overall, right? And so this is seen as a victory for Gingrich, uh, who will eventually be forced out of office because of scandal. And he was in large part able to achieve this because of Clinton's vulnerability. It should be noted, though, that because of this bipartisan wheeling and dealing that took place through the Clinton presidency, the eight years of his presidency, some of the deficit spending, which had begun to combat stagflation in the 1970s, was actually paid down. So when Reagan or excuse me, when Clinton comes into office, the Reagan policies actually had not created the amount of growth that many felt that it would that trickle down economics. The United States federal government was at negative two hundred and ninety million dollars in debt. So they're in debt. Two hundred and ninety billion dollars excuse me, not million billion. When Clinton leaves, there's $236 billion in surplus. So why don't we remember Clinton as this great savior? Because of the scandals, because he had these uh, sexual impropriety scandals, extramarital affairs that are investigated by independent counsel Kenneth Starr. Um, Starr ends up finding that Clinton lied under oath uh, during a Paula Jones deposition when the president of the United States was sued um, and he gave false testimony about extramarital affairs. This was proven uh, when Linda Tripp uh, provides information about her friend Monica Lewinsky engaging in an extramarital affair. She, of course, was a White House staffer. And Clinton will become impeached. And now he will be impeached. Uh, he'll become the second president impeached. Reagan, or excuse me, Nixon, remember, was not impeached. He resigned before he was impeached. Clinton is impeached. Articles of impeachment are drawn up against him. Uh, it is found that he has committed uh, high crimes and misdemeanors by the House of Representatives, that being his perjury on the stand when he said he wasn't conducting extramarital affairs and the obstruction of justice when it's found that he may have uh, tried to cover up his actions. Um Eventually, the Star Report, uh, in very lurid and explicit detail, uh, documents uh, the findings of Kenneth Starr, which was presented as a key piece of evidence against the president. Um, Monica Lewinsky was forced to give testimony in that or risk going to prison for upwards of 20 years for carrying on a consensual relationship with the president of the United States. But ultimately, because he had lied, he was found to be guilty and he was impeached. So... 40 years of presidential history, what does this all boil down to? What does this all mean? The 40 years from 1968 to 2000 can really be seen as a period of time of rapid expansion, both in the importance of and responsibilities of the um, American executive branch. The idea of the imperial presidency and the uh, president being the chief executive of not just the government, but of the country. This idea that the president is all things to all people and has more power than anybody else inside of the government really expands during this time. Many of the policies of these presidents, though, are reactionary. It's always trying to catch up with a problem that already exists. Um, and this uh, very much is a departure from what we saw in the Great Society, uh, and, and by and large, where there was this idea of modeling for the future. In case, and from 1968 on, we see many more cases of trying to just deal with the present, right? Presidential politics are sticky. They are very, very complicated. This is surely just an overview. Um, we very much hope you enjoyed all of this series, and we look forward to uh, seeing you guys back in person very, very soon. Thank you very much from the bottom of my heart for listening to all these from the entire U.S. History team. Bye.